Okay, good morning, everyone. So the question for today, the question for today is, is it possible to describe the ionic mechanisms of the action potential just as we describe the ionic mechanisms for the resting potential? Well, interestingly, it turns out that at the same time that Julius Bernstein, back in 1902, was proposing his hypothesis for the generation of the resting potential, another early physiologist slash neuroscientist uh, made a proposal for the ionic mechanisms underlying the action potential. Now, Overton knew from observations that sodium ions in the extracellular medium were absolutely essential for so-called animal elect electricity, nerve, and muscle cell excitability. But it wasn't until the 1940s when three giants in the field of physiology, Hodgkin, Huxley, and Katz, proposed a satisfactory a hypothesis for the action potential. And what they did was to suggest that whereas the resting potential is due to a large extent to the fact that the membrane is highly permeable to potassium and relatively little permeability to other ions. And therefore, the resting potential could be described as a first approximation by the Nernst equilibrium potential for potassium. What Hodgkin, Huxley, and Katz suggested was during the action potential, the membrane became highly, if not exclusively, permeable to sodium. Therefore, the peak of the action potential might be described by the equilibrium potential for sodium ions. And so the hypothesis was as followed, that the membrane potential, that's that VM, at the peak of the action potential is equal to, and I'll put a question mark here, the equilibrium potential for sodium, which you know, we don't have to put a question mark here, we know what it is, because according to Nernst, the equilibrium potential for sodium is 60 times the log of the outside sodium concentration divided by the inside sodium concentration. Now, sometimes you see a Z down here. But Z is the valence, valence and that's equal to 1. So I'm not putting the Z in the equations that I use. So this was the hypothesis. During the action potential, the membrane potential, the membrane becomes highly permeable to sodium. And as a result of that high permeability, the membrane potential moves up towards the sodium equilibrium potential. Well, how do we test this hypothesis? We test it just like we tested the hypothesis that potassium ions were critical for the resting potential. You vary the extracellular concentration of sodium. And if you vary the extracellular concentration of sodium, which is easy to do, if you vary this, right, then you should change the equilibrium potential. You will change the equilibrium potential for sodium. That's a given. But the question is, will you change the peak amplitude of the action potential in the same way, right? And if the two are in agreement, then you have provided some experimental proof that this relationship is correct. So here's the experiment that they did. And so what you see here is a series of three different panels, A, B, and C. The black trace is the normal action potential. Normal meaning that's the action potential recorded in the normal concentration of extracellular sodium. And what you see is three red action potentials. And these action potentials were recorded in the presence of reduced concentrations of extracellular sodium. 70% reduction, a 50% reduction, and a 33% reduction. And you clearly see that as the extracellular concentration of sodium is reduced, so is the peak amplitude of the action potential. And you can plot that on a semi-log plot, just like we did for the experiment with changing uh, the extracellular concentration of potassium. Now we're changing the sodium concentration. We're measuring the peak amplitude of the action potential. That's each one of these dots is an experimental measure, measurement at the respective concentration. And you see that as the extracellular concentration of sodium is altered, so is the peak amplitude of the action potential. Shown also on this graph is the straight line that you would predict for how the equilibrium potential changes as a function of changing the extracellular sodium concentration. So you see that there's a reasonable good agreement 
between the shape of these two curves, right? But it's not perfect, and there's always a deviation in that the peak amplitude of the action potential is always less depolarized than you would predict based on a membrane that was exclusively permeable to sodium, right? Does everybody see that? That's clear. So why do we have this deviation? The deviation is because the membrane is not exclusively permeable to sodium. Because we remember, we still have that potassium permeability that we started out with. So no matter how high you make the sodium permeability within reason, there is still going to be that finite potassium permeability that endows the membrane with the resting potential. Right? Now here's a, a schematic diagram of an action potential. And it shows the waveform of the action potential that we're going to try to explain as we go along today. And it also shows a number of different key potentials. You see this dashed line here. This is the sodium equilibrium potential, which for this particular neuron is plus 55 millivolts. You also see this value of minus 60 millivolts. That's the resting potential. And finally, you see this value down here of minus 75 millivolts, and that's the potassium equilibrium potential. What you see is that the action potential bounds a region which on one extreme is the potassium equilibrium potential, and on the other extreme, the sodium equilibrium potential. At rest, the membrane potential is negative. It's near, but not equal to the potassium equilibrium potential. Why not? Because there is that basal sodium permeability, one one hundredth of the potassium permeability. And that makes the membrane potential slightly more positive than you would predict for a membrane that was exclusively permeable to potassium. Then you have this value, the sodium equilibrium potential. Note that the action potential approaches the sodium equilibrium potential, but it doesn't get, quite get there. It would only reach the sodium equilibrium potential if the membrane was exclusively permeable to sodium. It doesn't get there because there's still that finite potassium permeability. So you see, you start at the resting potential, you can have an increase in sodium permeability to make the membrane potential rise rapidly to the peak. Then we have the repolarization phase and the after hyperpolarization phase that uh, we need to understand. So the big question for now is how does that switch occur? So what Hodgkin and Huxley and their uh, colleagues suggested was that there are two fundamentally different types of membrane channels that span cell membranes. One type of channel is, is the type of channel that gives rise to the resting potential. These channels are normally open, and they allow for potassium ions to move out and sodium ions to move in. Then they suggested that there was a totally different type of membrane channel, a so-called voltage-gated or voltage-regulated channels. And these were channels that were hypothesized to open in response to a depolarization. They were normally closed, but if the membrane was depolarized, these channels would open. Let me just give you a, a diagram of what the properties of one of those channels might look like. So if on one axis we plot the permeability to sodium, right, PNA, and on the other axis we plot the membrane depolarization. And what was suggested was that there are these specialized channels that are normally closed, meaning low permeability. But as the membrane is depolarized, these channels open, allowing the permeability of the membrane uh, to sodium to increase. Right. So this is a diagram of so-called voltage-dependent permeability, because the permeability is dependent upon the level of depolarization. So with this diagram, or this hypothesis allows you to uh, actually predict how an action potential might be elicited. Let's say that the membrane potential is normally here. And this is the resting potential here. And at the resting potential, the permeability to sodium is very low. Now, let's just assume that there's some stimulus, whether it be a synaptic potential or some artificial depolarization that moves the membrane potential in a more positive direction. Based on this relationship, if the membrane is now changed from here to here, that will tell you that the permeability 
has increased from here to here, right? Now you have to take the next logical step forward and ask yourself, what is the consequence of an increase in the permeability to sodium? The answer is a depolarization. So as a result of this increase in permeability, that will lead to a further depolarization. And what? That's not, there it is, a further depolarization. So this increase in permeability will lead to a further depolarization. What will be the consequence of that further depolarization? A further increase in sodium permeability. What will be the in consequence of the further increase in sodium permeability? A further depolarization. So I think you can see that once you get this thing going, you rapidly move the membrane potential up to these depolarized levels. Specifically, you can generate an action potential in principle by endowing the membrane with channels that are voltage dependent. Okay, this was the theory, but they went on to test this theory. And by the way, you can see this, how this would work from the goldman hodgkin katz equation, which is uh, 60, again, times the log of the outside potassium concentration plus alpha times the outside sodium concentration divided by the inside potassium concentration plus alpha times the inside sodium concentration. That's pretty sloppy, but where alpha is equal to the ratio of the sodium permeability to the potassium permeability, right? So if the sodium permeability starts to getting higher, you see that alpha becomes a larger number. So you multiply a larger number times the sodium concentration terms. And therefore, the Goldman equation would predict that the membrane potential will move closer to the sodium equilibrium potential, right? So you can think about it intuitively, or you can do the math and just plug the numbers into the goldman hodgkin katz equation. Now, Hodgkin, Huxley, and Katz and their colleagues went one step further. They asked the question, well, this is a nice hypothesis, but how do we prove it? And what they did was to actually go ahead and measure the changes in membrane, membrane permeability as a function of the voltage. And here's an experiment. Here's an experimental result. And they used a technique called the voltage clamp, which allows one to clamp the membrane potential, as I'll show you in a moment, at various levels of membrane potential, and then measure the sodium conductance. The sodium conductance is an electrical measure of permeability. We'll use the two interchangeably. So here's the first experiment that they did. They changed the membrane potential from its normal level of minus 60 millivolts to a new level of minus 35 millivolts. The importance of this technique, by the way, it's called a clamp, is because you can change the membrane potential to a depolarized level and force the membrane potential to stay there. So you don't, you prevent the cell from initiating an action potential. Because if you have an action potential, then all the permeability changes are going to happen and be over with in one millisecond. So you have to prevent that from happening. So the voltage clamp pr proposal, the, the voltage clamp approach allows you to do that. So what you see is that when you change the membrane potential from minus 60 to minus 35, there is a change in the sodium conductance or sodium permeability. If now you repeat this, but instead depolarize the cell to minus 20 millivolts, you see that there is an additional change in sodium conductance. And if you change the membrane potential to plus 20 millivolts, the change in sodium permeability is even greater. So what this experiment clearly shows is that the greater the depolarization, the greater is the permeability. So you could take this value, and then you could take this value, and you can take this value, and you could plot it on this curve, you put your points here, and, oops, you put your points here, and you could reconstruct this kind of relationship between depolarization and permeability. So this experiment then gave strong experimental evidence that there are these voltage-dependent changes, these, uh, these, these channels in the membrane that respond to voltage, channels that are normally closed, but in response to a depolarization open, allowing sodium ions to move across the membrane. There's another interesting aspect of this experimental result. And uh, you see it in the traces. 
you see that there is a very rapid increase in the sodium permeability as you depolarize the cell. But here's something very interesting. Note that despite the fact that the membrane potential continues to be depolarized for this entire period of time, four milliseconds, you see that the sodium conductance increases, but then it spontaneously decays back to where it started. That's a process called inactivation. So despite the fact that the membrane channels open in response to that depolarization, even if you maintain the depolarization, they close down. They don't like to stay open. They just open for a several millisecond period of time. So is this just an interesting experimental curiosity, or does it have some importance? What might be uh, the importance of inactivation? OK, I think everybody, even though this is really sloppy, everybody liked this positive. This is a positive feedback regenerative cycle. Once you start the cycle going, the sodium permeability increases, more depolarization, and you rapidly move the membrane potential up to a very depolarized level that's associated with a very high level of permeability. So I think everybody was comfortable with how this could explain the initiation of the action potential. But what if there was no inactivation? There would be no repolarization. So you need something, once those sodium channels open, you need something to close them back down again. Otherwise, you would only have one action potential. You would only have one twitch of a muscle, one beat of your heart, uh, one thought, one sensation. That would be it. And then all your nerve cells would be permanently depolarized. Not good. So there needs to be a way of returning the membrane potential back down to the resting potential after you have the peak value. And inactivation is one of the mechanisms that contributes to that. But is that the only mechanism? Somebody's shaking their head saying no. What's the other mechanism? The sodium potassium ATPase. That is not correct. <laughs> Sounds good. And it is an important mechanism. I'm going to get to that at the end of the lecture. So you're saying you need to activate the pump to, well, because all this sodium came into the cell, and we need to activate the pump to pump it back out again. That's essentially what you're saying. I'll explain later why that's not correct. OK, your partner is saying a voltage-gated potassium. So yes, in addition to membrane channels that are voltage-dependent, that are closed, and when they open, they allow sodium to come in to the cell, there are also voltage-dependent potassium channels. So these are channels that are permeable to potassium and but are normally closed. But in response to a depolarization, they open, allowing potassium ions to move out of the cell. This next experiment shows you a simultaneous uh, measurement of both the changes in sodium conductance or permeability and the changes in potassium permeability in response to different changes in depolarization. So here's, we're changing the membrane potential from minus 60 to minus 35. Here are the changes in sodium permeability we saw previously. And now what you see below is that there are also changes in potassium permeability. If you give a larger depolarization, you get a larger change in sodium permeability, and you get a larger change in potassium permeability. If you give even a larger depolarization, there is a larger change in sodium permeability and a larger change in potassium permeability. So the same kind of relationship applies to the potassium channels, the voltage-dependent potassium channels, as we saw for the voltage-dependent sodium channels. OK? Now, despite the fact that this channel and this channel are voltage-dependent, there are several critical differences between the two. One obvious difference, of course, is that this channel is permeable to sodium and this channel is permeable to potassium. But there are two other major differences, one that is really important. Can you see it right before your eyes? You see the two differences. What are they? The latency. So by that, you mean that whereas the sodium channels open very rapidly in response to the depolarization, there is a delay in the opening of the voltage-dependent potassium channels. That's the latency you're referring to, right? 
Okay, so big deal. So one's fast, the other's slow. Let me just think of this for a moment. What if the potassium channels didn't have that latency? What if the potassium channels opened just as quickly as the sodium channels? Would that be good? That would be bad. That would be real bad because whereas these channels are trying to depolarize the cell, opening these channels are trying to hyperpolarize the cell. So the two processes would be working against each other. And you probably wouldn't get any action potential. So this latency is absolutely essential uh, for the potassium channels to contribute to the action potential. Now they do open, but with a delay. And why is that important? Because it gives time for the sodium permeability changes to move the membrane potential up towards the sodium equilibrium potential, do their job, and now the voltage dependent changes in potassium can kick in and help repolarize the membrane along with the inactivation of the sodium channels. So there's two processes that are contributing to the repolarization. The process of sodium inactivation, the intrinsic process, and the delayed increase in potassium permeability. So the nervous system is investing a lot in bringing that action potential back down to the resting potential as soon as possible. And why do you want to do that? You want to have a short duration action potential. Why do you want to have a short duration action potential? So you can have a whole bunch of them per unit time and so that your nerve cells can participate in this coding of information. Okay, this next slide, actually a series of slides, is just going to step us through in a systematic way the changes in membrane potential, sodium conductance in red, and potassium conductance in blue. So let's begin. We have some stimulus. Let's not worry about exactly what it is from right now. It could be a synaptic potential. It could be an artificial depolarization. But some initial stimulus, this depolarization here, leads to an increase in the sodium permeability. As a result of that increase in sodium permeability, there is a further depolarization. So we enter this positive feedback cycle such that increase in sodium leads to a depolarization. Depolarization leads to greater sodium permeability and we rapidly move the membrane potential up to the peak value. Note that while the sodium changes are occurring very rapidly, there is relatively little changes in the potassium conductance. But now, when we get to the peak of the action potential, you see these two processes occurring. One is that the membrane potential starts to decay, and that's due in part to the inactivation process. Although the inactivation process itself contributes to the repolarization of the membrane. But we have the inactivation illustrated here. And then at this point in time, you also see that the potassium permeability is beginning to increase dramatically. At a slightly later time, the potassium permeability is even greater. The membrane repolarization is even greater. And a slightly different, longer time now, we see the membrane potential has returned back to the resting potential. This is an interesting point in time because the membrane potential is back to the resting potential. The sodium permeability is back to where it started. But look what the potassium permeability is doing. Look what the potassium permeability is doing. Just as these potassium channels are slow to open, they're also kind of slow to close. So what's the consequences of a situation at this point in time where the sodium permeability is back to normal, but the potassium permeability is still elevated. You will have the undershoot or hyperpolarizing after potential because the membrane potential will be more permeable to potassium than it was at rest. Remember at rest, it was 0.01. The alpha value was 0.01 because of the resting potassium permeability. Now there's going to be this additional voltage dependent uh, potassium permeability and that's going to contribute to the after hyperpolarization. Eventually, the membrane channels that are permeable to potassium, the voltage dependent channels, will return to their basal levels and the membrane potential will return back to the resting potential. So this then is the entire sequence of events 
that underlies the initiation, the polarization, the peak value, remember we tried in the overshoot, the repolarizing phase, and the after hyperpolarization. So you need to know all these different phases of the action potential. You can see why it by itself cannot contribute, it cannot explain the later phases of the action potential. If you just look at the changes in sodium permeability by themselves, you see they extend out to four milliseconds. The action potential is much narrower than that. So you need help. The sodium inactivation process needs help, and the potassium delayed increase in potassium helps out. Also, if the action potential was just based on these changes in sodium permeability, you could have an action potential, and it would repolarize, but you wouldn't have an after hyperpolarization. Because in order to get the after hyperpolarization, you have to have the net potassium permeability greater than it is at rest. Now, there's some interesting pharmacologic work that supports this theory. Two drugs have been identified that have been useful experimentally. Uh, one is called uh, tetrodotoxin. What tetrodotoxin does is illustrated in the next slide using the voltage clamp approach. So this is just the changes in voltage-dependent sodium and potassium permeability that are elicited with these different depolarizations. And what you see here is in the presence of tetrodotoxin, or TTX, the voltage-dependent changes in sodium permeability are completely abolished. What tetrodotoxin does, we know now, didn't know when these experiments were first done, is it plugs up the pore of the sodium channel. So the sodium channel tries to open, tetrodotoxin goes in, it blocks it up so sodium cannot pass through. Then there's another interesting drug, TEA, or tetraethylammonium. And what you can see what TEA does is that it selectively blocks the voltage-dependent potassium channels, but not the voltage-dependent sodium channels. So in a sense, it's like TEA. It also is an open channel blocker. It gets into the channel, it plugs it up, so potassium ions can't go through. So if you had any doubt about it before, this clearly shows that these two channels are separate. Whereas they're both voltage dependent and they have different permeabilities, you can see you can selectively block one but not the other. So it's not as though one channel is becoming permeability permeable to sodium and then later becomes permeable to uh, potassium. It's two separate channels. And as you'll learn throughout the course and in physiology, there's many, many tens, if not hundreds, of different types of membrane channels that all have a unique role in contributing to the excitability of nerve cells. We're just going to talk about them very generically here, the voltage-dependent sodium channel and the voltage-dependent potassium channel. So given these two drugs, what would you expect them to do to an action potential. With TTX, you wouldn't have an action potential. And I don't think there's easy, any reason to, to show that because you would, it would block the voltage-dependent sodium channels. You can't have an action potential without voltage-dependent sodium channels. By the way, is there any clinical application for a drug that would uh, block a uh, voltage-dependent sodium channel, or is this just an experimental curiosity or tool? Remember the first slide I gave you a bunch of neurological disorders? Is there any one of those neurological disorders that might be amenable to treatment with a drug like tetrodotoxin? You obviously have to be very careful about the dose. Like epilepsy. Not like epilepsy, yes, epilepsy. <laughs> so epilepsy is a disorder associated with abnormal neuronal discharges, right? So you want to quiet or dampen them down. So one way to do that, I mean, it's very crude, but is to block some of the voltage-dependent sodium channels, right? But again, you have to be very careful with, it, with it, the dosage. Now, tetrodotoxin is not used, but there is a drug that is used. What's the name of the drug that's used to treat epilepsy? I'm thinking of Dilantin. There may be others. That's one. Okay, TEA. What would uh, TEA do to an action potential? The trototoxin is going to block them. What would TEA do? Someone in the front is saying it would make the action potential longer. Does everybody agree? 
Anything else? You wouldn't have an undershoot. Absolutely. Here, here's the experiment that shows that. So here's two action potentials, a normal action potential, and then re one recorded in the presence of TEA. You see the initial phase of the action potential in both cases looks very similar. But this action potential is much broader, and it doesn't have an after hyperpolarization. You have an action potential that repolarizes. How is it possible that this can repolarize? The closing of the sodium channels, the inactivation of the sodium channels. So here, this clearly shows you what the inactivation, this is a neat experiment in a way, because it shows you what the inactivation process by itself does. It does, you can have an action potential, but the action potential based solely on the sodium inactivation process is going to be somewhat longer in duration then would an action potential be that uses the combined processes, the processes of sodium inactivation and the delayed increase in potassium. Okay? Yes? What would be the consequences of ingesting some TEA? It would be really pretty bad. <laughs> so, so action potentials, uh, let's just talk about muscle cells. You're going to learn about muscle cells and physiology if you haven't already. So muscle action potentials are just like nerve action potentials. You have voltage-dependent changes in sodium permeability and voltage-dependent changes in potassium permeability that contribute to the repolarization. And when you have an action potential in a muscle cell, that produces a twitch, right? So you mentioned spasticity. So what would happen if you were to ingest a bunch of TEA? You would have major contractions of all the muscles, all the skeletal muscles in your body and your nervous system would be pretty excitable also. Yeah, so. You couldn't get multiple, well, you could still get multiple action potentials, but they wouldn't be as, they wouldn't, you couldn't get as, as many <laughs> as for what, a given period of time, but the whole neuron would be more excitable. Okay, I want to return to the issue of the sodium-potassium uh, pump. Uh, because it's related to this other issue about the amount of sodium that comes into a cell with the action potential uh, and the amount of potassium that leaves the cell. Now, it's very easy to get the impression, and I must say I've been guilty of it to a certain extent, and it's a lot of people are guilty to it about it. A lot of people are guilty in the textbooks you read in that you get the impression that when you have an action potential, there's this gush of sodium that runs into the cell, that moves into the cell. And also there's this gush of potassium that leaves the cell. You get the impression that that could change the concentration of sodium inside the cell because of all that sodium that comes in from the outside to the inside, right? Is that what you think? You get easily to think that. And some sodium does come into the cell. But it's a, it's a minute amount compared to the normal uh, intracellular concentration, which is in the millimolar range the amount of sodium that crosses the membrane is in the picomolar range. So whereas some sodium comes into the cell, it produces no net change in the concentration of sodium within the cell. The change in potential is across the microscopically thin cell membrane. That's where the charge distribution occurs. There's not a big change in the number of positive sodium ions inside the cell or a change in the number of potassium ions. It's all the changes are across the thin surface of the membrane. And that's why the voltage depend, that's why the sodium potassium pump is not essential because there's no change in sodium concentration, so you don't really need the sodium potassium pump to repolarize the membrane. Okay? Now, the sodium potassium pump is important, though, in the long term. And an interesting experiment was done many years ago, and there's an agent that's used to block the sodium potassium pump. What is it? Somebody's saying it. It's kind of wa, wabane. Yeah, wabane uh, is used to block the sodium potassium pump. Actually, has some clinical utility. What's the clinical utility of wabane? Somebody said heart. Used to treat people with congestive heart failure. Learned about the mechanism for that shortly in physiology. <laughs> 
But what you can do is you can treat a nerve axon with Wabane, which blocks the sodium potassium pump. And in the presence of that Wabane, you can fire more than 500,000 action potentials in the presence of that sodium potassium pump, with there being no change in the amplitude of the action potential and no change in the resting potential. So that experiment clearly shows you that the sodium potassium pump is not necessary for the action potential to action potential sequence that we see in the nervous system. Now, with prolonged treatments of Wabane, however, there is a change in the resting potential. There is a change in the peak amplitude of the action potential. That's because that small amount of sodium that comes in with every action potential eventually builds up to the point where it does produce a concentration change. But you need a lot of action potentials before that happens. So you can think of the sodium potassium pump as the generator in your car, right? You have bat a battery in your car, and the battery needs to be charged. The battery can run the lights and a lot of the electrical equipment for a long period of time. Probably leave your lights on for 24 hours, right, without the engine running. That's based on the battery. Eventually, you've got to charge the battery. That's what the generator does. So what the sodium potassium pump does is charge the nerve cell batteries. And there's two nerve cell batteries that are important. There is the battery for sodium, the equilibrium potential for sodium, and there's the battery for potassium, the equilibrium potential for potassium. So you maintain the sodium equilibrium potential battery by maintaining the sodium concentration inside the cell low, and you maintain the potassium equilibrium potential battery by maintaining the concentration of potassium inside the cell high. Right? So the sodium potassium pump makes the batteries, charges the batteries, and then the action potential uses those batteries for its generation. OK, is that clear? Okay, we're going to do one more thing, one more aspect of the action potential. And that's something called the absolute and refractory uh, periods. And so the absolute refractory period, this is a period of time after you initiate one action potential where it's impossible to generate another action potential no matter how much you stimulate the cell. All right, let's say you initially need a depolarization of 15 millivolts to get an action potential. If you initiate that action potential and then try to initiate an action potential very soon thereafter, even if you depolarize the cell by 100 millivolts, you can't get another action potential. Then there's this other period of time called the relative refractory period, where it's possible to initiate another action potential, but only with a greater stimulus. That's relative. So let me make a little diagram to show you these two different um, features. So let's just say that we have a cell at, at minus uh, 60 millivolts. And um, we have the threshold of minus 45 millivolts, right? So if we depolarize the cell to minus 45 millivolts, which is a reasonable value for the threshold, that then would lead to the initiation of this all or nothing action potential, and we would have the hyperpolarizing after potential, right? Let's talk about the relative refractory period. What if we, what if we tried to give her, to deliver, what if we tried to deliver now a second stimulus? Remember, this was a depolarization of 15 millivolts, right? 15. What if we delivered that same 15 millivolt stimulus here? It would be subthreshold. It wouldn't reach threshold, so the same stimulus that was used here would not be sufficient to fire an action potential here. However, if this stimulus was made somewhat larger, then we could initiate another action potential, right? So in a sense, the, the relative refractory period is due at least in part to the after hyperpolarization. Now, the absolute refractory period is this period of time right after, after an action potential when no matter how much you depolarize the cell, you cannot generate another action potential. In order to understand the absolute refractory period, we have to return to this process of inactivation. And it's shown here. So here you see 
two voltage clamp pulses. This is just like the one I showed you earlier. It's just a different time compression. You depolarize the cell from, what's this, minus 60 up to about zero millivolts. And then you measure the changes in sodium permeability. Just like what you saw, there's the process of activation or opening of the channel. And then there's the inactivation process. If you give a second pulse, a second depolarizing stimulus, several milliseconds later, you see that you get a change in sodium permeability, just like the change that you saw the first time. But now the interesting result is here, and that is when you deliver this second pulse at times less than this one, if the second pulse comes closer and closer to the first pulse, you see that the change in sodium permeability is less than produced by the first pulse. And if the second pulse comes very soon after the first, you see the second pulse produces absolutely no change in sodium permeability. Isn't that pretty weird? So what this shows you, this, what this tells you is that when you open and inactivate a channel, it takes time to recover from that inactivation. The channel opens and then it closes, but it will not allow a membrane depolarization to open it again until it has a little bit of a rest period. You can think of it that way. So this slow process of recovery from inactivation endows the cell with the absolute refractory period. Why? Let's say now we're talking about action potentials in nerve cells. Let's just say this is the first depolarization producing an action potential. If you try to depolarize the cell again right here, you're not going to be able to get another action potential because the, the channels have not recovered from their inactivation. Right? It's like you've taken the sodium channels away. Is there any value to the absolute refractory period? Is it good for anything or just a, it's actually you might think it's bad. You might think it's bad because it prevents you from getting more action potential. So what if this was a nerve and you have an action potential propagating down to the end of the nerve, right? What's going to happen when it gets to the end? Is it going to go back? What stops it from going back once it gets to the end? It can't go back because the membrane channels here are inactivated. So even though there's a depolarization at the end of the axon, that depolarization is spreading backwards, but it can't initiate another action potential here because the membrane channels that it left behind are inactivated. So this process of inactivation, which seems kind of silly, actually is absolutely essential for existence because without it, once we had an action potential in one part of an axon, we would have action potentials going back and forth continuously forever. That wouldn't be very good, right? So an activation is a really essential part of the, our existence. OK, and that actually leads me to the final topic. And that is, once you have an action potential at one part of a nerve cell, like the cell body, how does it propagate to the distant regions of the synapse? And that distance, of course, can be uh, many meters in length. So that's the process of propagation of the action potential. And we will pick up with that when we return in 10 minutes. Thank you.